So maybe some comments about uh, what Pavel said. You know, I think there are good reasons to to agree with what he said. You know, it's not a good idea to work on bovine as uh, horses and all that a priori because you know, the generation time is very long and you, know, you can't really do what you want, like in sea elegance and so on. So I think it's entirely. Uh, entirely a logical decision for many smart people not to embark into these uh, with these organisms. But this being said, if you look at uh, at the roots of uh, uh, certainly quantitative genetics in the first half and even after that of the second century, people like C. W. Wright and R. A. Fisher, and, and after that people like Alan Robertson, Bill Hill that have made major contributions to fundamental population genetics. In fact, their, their original motivation was very often in agriculture. And I, and I remember at some point Lander making a talk about Mendel, and apparently the, the kind of research that Mendel was doing was actually driven by an agricultural context uh, uh, as well. So there, there is some strong tradition in genetics in the, uh, in the agricultural uh, field. Um, so, so, one of the features of the new technologies is that, in fact, you can apply them to any kind of uh, organism. So, they are very, very genetic. I think, for instance, that next generation sequencing. And, and that actually makes that you can, you have the possibility now to address a number of biological questions uh, rooted in interesting observations in natural populations. And contrary to Things that were totally impossible only a few years ago are actually becoming uh, possible now in any in any species. I think if, if one person really illustrates that very well, it's Leif Anderson from the University of Uppsala, who, you know, six months after six months, come with these absolutely beautiful stories uh, using either domestic animals or uh, natural populations. Okay, so following. Uh, Pavel's request to talk about what is happening in animal agriculture. Uh, I, I quickly, this afternoon, put, put this talk here together. And I really have to acknowledge to start with Carol Charlier. She is there. So the work that I will present is, to a large extent, her or in her team's work in our uh, lab. So what I thought I would do is, rather than just to tell you about uh, genomics in general in, uh, in animal breeding. I will root it in some of the work from our lab, because that's always easier. And, and uh, we are from Belgium, so a lot of this work is actually focusing on a local breed. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that breed and what Carol and her team uh, have been doing. And at the end, I think we will have time to generalize and I will update you on what is happening in animal breeding in general. And I, I can tell you right away that, although it's not our work, uh, uh, you know, I think there are really very interesting things happening there, which I think might, to some extent, announce also in the technologies that are being used what may be common in medical genomics. I truly believe that, that there are some approaches that are presently being used at a very large scale in agriculture, which are progressively making their way, and for good reasons, in medical genomics. And that might actually be a good way for us to finish the discussion at the end of time. So, so this is kind of the, the plan that I have for you. So I'll tell you a bit about the system. Our, uh, our uh, Cherie Chacon here, called Belgian Blue Cattle Breeds. And so we, Carol has been studying a series of inherited defects in these breeds. Then, more recently, she has been studying embryonic lethality using a reverse genetic approach, contrary to the first phenotypes, which she approached by a classical forward genetics approach. And, and I'll tell you where we are going with uh, complex, complex phenotypes 
remembering that the vast majority of the phenotypes that are of agricultural economic importance are quantitative traits which are distributed in a Gaussian way and which have the architecture which is typically referred to as the one of complex or multifactorial uh, phenotypes. So I'll, I'll tell you, um, I'll go through the talk following this plan here and for those of you that are interested, I'm citing uh, two uh, uh, relatively re recent publications, not all of them, this one is quite old, but that uh, describe some of the results. So first of all, the Belgian blue uh, cattle breed. So it's a, 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 these are cows, and the specificity of these cows is that a large proportion of them are blue. So it's Belgian blue cattle, they are in fact grey, but the name given to these animals is uh, blue. So something really quite remarkable happens to this breed in 50 years. So it used to, it used to be a breed called Has de Moyenne in Belgique, which was just kind of a geographical location where these animals were found initially. And at that time, like most cattle breeds, this breed was what is called a dual purpose breed. So you could even say a, a, that there were three of them. So it was milk, it was meat, and it was actually energy. So at that time still they would use these animals for traction of, uh, of the And so very standard in, in the human culture, this breed was one of these breeds. And it, it stayed like that uh, until the 60s. And then for whatever kind of strange reason, it, it was subject to a selection for increased muscle mass that Belgian breeders applied to cattle, to pigs, to sheep, and even to horses. So one of the specificities of our country is that in all these species, the local breeders, nearly as a hobby, have selected for very heavily muscled animals. And I'll show you that, it's a sort of a local passion, and it continues to, uh, to exist. And somewhere illustrating the, the adaptability of domestic animals as an illustration of natural population, the response to selection is absolutely extraordinary. So, uh, kind of the first fundamental question is, what is it about the architecture of our genome that allows our phenotype to very rapidly go in whatever direction natural selection can go. So there's, I think there's, there's really something about how organisms are made that makes them particularly flexible and able to really respond to selection pressure in whatever direction you want the population or selection wants the population to go. So here I'll show you some pictures to show you what happens in a few generations. So, and so, so I got these from the, the web page of the herd book, you know, the people that are very much involved with this book. So this is what these cows, you cannot see them, they were blue already, looked, you know, before the Second World War. So people of you that are familiar with these things, they will see that they are not particularly muscled and they have a big udder. So they can produce milk and they're used also for milk. And if you look at their behind, uh, at, you know, at that time, you would have seen something that is, looks like this. So very regular cows. And then people started to select for a trait which was called double muscle and was viewed everywhere in the world. It, it had been noticed that it was viewed as a genetic defect because it would create problems at birth, which could only be overcome by cesarean inception. But the Belgian breeders didn't care about this problem apparently, being obsessed by muscle. And in a matter of, let's say, you know, it's going from the 60s to 85, so in 25, 30 years, they generated these animals that had relatively big buttocks. They were called double muscle. And I don't know what the next slide is, uh, is showing, but so to some extent my PhD thesis nearly was to try to understand the molecular basis of the, the double muscle trait, which was fixed 
in the Belgian blue breed in at around 80-85. So it was an anomaly in 1960, and the breeders selected for it, and it was pretty much affecting 100% of the population, who already at that time all needed cesarean section to be born, to, to, to appear very quick. And so there was a whole study by our mentor, Carol and I, about how many genes were involved by classical segregation analysis. There was evidence that there was a major <laughs> gene, and this was proven when we closed the corresponding gene, which proved to be a gene called myostatin, and we found loss of function mutations in myostatin in Belgian blue, but then after that in plenty of other uh, breeds. So, in fact, if you look at this, at this trait in multiple breeds, it has been found in multiple breeds, and you try to decipher the molecular basis, pretty much always you will find myostatin mutations, but there are different mutations. But so what that shows is that there are not very many genes that can, upon mutation, give a hypermuscular phenotype without having negative consequences. You always run into this gene. If I now, so that's, so, so you saw the picture of these animals in 1980, and this is what the animals look like. So, obsessed by their passion, the breeders have continued to select, and the animals now are close to explosion. So, if you look at the textbook, Molecular Biology of the Cell, it will talk about this calo, this TGF beta member, which is myostatin, and it will show this animal, and it will say that mutations in myostatin cause this thing. It's not true. Mutations in myostatin have a relatively big effect, but this is something that has been built on top of this initial double muscle in a period of, let's say, again, 30, 40 years, but that is not due to myostatin. The question is, what, uh, what is it? Okay? And it's one of the things I will address. So these Belgian blue cattle have an exceptional uh, phenotype. So for people that are in agriculture, lots of muscles made without having to put more food into the animal. So very efficient machines to transform uh, uh, vegetables into, into uh, uh, animal protein. And the meat is a bit special, but at least in Belgium, considered to be and healthy and tasty by the consumers. <coughs> so although passion certainly played a role in the minds of the farmers, economy was the major drive. So when a butcher buys an animal like that, he can make much more money out of it than out of a regular animal, and that ultimately is what drove the fact that at the present time, one million animals in Belgium are of that uh, character. It's one million pure so, what is also happening is that uh, people from around the world have discovered that when they cross dairy cows with an animal like that, <laughs> the cows that are born are also much more heavily muscled and therefore work much more money. And so there is a very, very rapidly growing export market of genes of Belgian blues everywhere in the world, including China, to in so-called uh, crossbreed. So there is a lot of interest in these animals at the present time. But of course there are a certain number of drawbacks. If you look at within Belgium, you know, the first drawback is 100% cesarean section, which means that every time you buy a cow, you need to buy a veterinarian. Fortunately, the veterinarian is cheaper than the cow those days. And that's something that we heard talk about a lot 10 years ago, is that these animals were considered to be fragile by the breeder. They had to be extremely careful with these animals. And there was a mortality of approximately 12, in, in, in not so long ago, approximately 12% of the cows that would be born would die within a few weeks of age from a whole range of disorders. And in fact, the exact nature of this fragility was was not enough. It was considered to be multifactorial, potentially related to uh, blue. Breed. So, uh, a number of years ago, we were, some veterinarians talked to us in, about a, a defect that's, that appeared to be relatively common. And at the time, the question was, 
is this viral, is this toxic, is this genetic? And so it was not obvious. And the standard way of doing these studies was to try to do epidemiology before you started to do molecular work, because molecular work was expensive. But things were changing rapidly at the time, and you could imagine to do autozygosity mapping without having to spend that much money, certainly not compared to what it would have been in the early 90s. So just to remind you, the, the uh, principle of autozygosity mapping, so you make a hypothesis that these animals that are abnormal suffer from a recessive defect. You are working in a relatively close, highly inbred population, so it's a bit like a, a founder population or a genetic isolate in human genetics. So it's reasonable to say that it might be the defect might involve one founder mutation. This founder mutation has appeared or been introduced in the population on a given chromosome, which is shown here in yellow, and that, that appeared in the population X generation back. But if you take a number of cases at the present generation, if it's an autosomal recessive trait, you predict homozygosity for the mutation and also for a piece of the haplotype upon which the mutation appeared initially. So in fact, you look for regions in the genome where your sample of affected individuals is homozygous for the same haplotype, a approach called autozygosity measure. So doing that had been complicated just before that, because people were playing with microsatellites, the density was not large enough to capture haplotypes. But as soon as species were being sequenced, that SNPs were being uh, identified, and that chips were being developed to cheaply and rapidly interrogate them, and so they're very quickly, in fact, we designed our own uh, uh, bovine SNP arrays, so we could genotype uh, a, a, a sample of affected individuals looking for signatures that are uh, shown here. So what you see here is an example of one trait where you see a piece of chromosome 3 or the entire chromosome 3. Every uh, line here would be a SNP. I have 14 individuals, let's say, and uh, I have different genotypes that are shown either in yellow, let's say, if the animal is homozygous, and red would be heterozygous. So what you see are these regions where all the affected individuals are homozygous for the same haplotype, and if you take controls, you don't have that. As I said, then you can put some statistics on this thing to show that it's highly significant you have not the gene. And so this is becoming so easy and so effective that it becomes a tool that replaces standard epidemiology. If you have a phenotype which is of undetermined origin, take a few samples which show the phenotype, run the arrays. If you find the locus, you have a response to your, a response to your uh, question. And so this is showing an example of these 14 cases, but we have gone as low as three cases and found highly significant results. So this really changed uh, uh, things considerably when it came to the question, is this abnormality that I detect in the population, what is the cause of it? Could it be genetic? Well, if you find the gene, obviously it is genetic. What I showed before is not finding the gene, it's locating the gene. The, the, the population uh, characteristics of these animals are such that the resolution is not as good as in humans. So you're typically left with two to three million base pairs and lots of genes. So you have the location without any doubt, but you don't have the gene. So there things have evolved extremely rapidly as well. So a few years ago, you, know, you had to go sequence the exons which you pcr up. It was still relatively demanding, so you would focus on candidate genes. Today, when we do that, we would right away sequence one or more affected uh, individuals, and so that we directly have the entire mutations uh, uh, present in the interval. And maybe to go through some key ideas, so who would you want to sequence to have the best chance to find a mutation quickly? But the ideal thing is to take an individual that is homozygous for the same haplotype, so he has this same genotype as these individuals, but he is not affected. 
So what that means is that he, he's, he carries two haplotypes that are phylogenetically, if you want, closely related. So they have diverged not a very long time ago, but one is carrying the mutation and the other one not. So if you sequence that individual, every mutation that is homozygous can be excluded as a causative mutation. You are looking for the mutation that happened you know, relatively recently on that haplotype, and so this approach has proven to be uh, extremely uh, powerful. And, and so we, we now typically, very quickly, would map the gene. If we find something, we would sequence affected individuals and unaffected individuals that, if possible, have the features that I just described. And we would, if we can, directly on top of that, have RNA seeds so that we can directly uh, look for functional evidence. And so this is just an example where uh, what Carol found in one case of atrophiposis. So there's a zoom here in the integrated genome viewer where you see a mutation which sits at a tree prime end in an intron, at a tree prime of an exon, but outside of your canonical splicing. Region. So you, know, you would not consider that it already to be something that would have affected splicing. And in fact, when you do RNA-seq, you see that you have the skipping of this exon. So although it's not positioned in a what is typically you know, the plus two or minus two, it still has a big effect on splicing, and so Carol could immediately identify that by combining DNA-seq with RNA-seq uh, uh, So the strategy is there. If you want to, the breed is a breed that has a lot of defects. You try to tell the breeders, talk about it, which usually they don't do. They, if they have an anomaly in their herd, they, they, you know, they make a hole in the garden, put the animal in there, and don't tell anyone because they think they can't sell their, uh, their animals anymore. So you tell them, tell us, call this number, a vet will come and pick up the animal, make an accurate diagnosis. And so we had a, a small team, but of people that for several years has been collecting thousands of samples within what we have called this Peridot surveillance platform. So we have some sort of a database with samples attached of plenty of anomalies that are described in the population. And as soon as we had a small number of anomalies that looked the same, we would subject them to the approach that I described. And so when Carol did that, very rapidly, she detected, uh, so she studied eight diseases, mapped all of them, and found the causative mutation for all of them. So identifying causative mutations for confirmed inherited defects when they are recessive is really becoming something that can be done extremely uh, effectively. I think I mentioned this story uh, last year, and I, I have to mention it. So Carol studied diseases, but she also studied cold color, the cold color patterns from these animals. And one of the cold colors you may remember is so-called color silent. So animals don't have pigmentation on the back. And when she studied that together with an excellent postdoc, Keith Durkin, they found an extraordinary mechanism where the mutation causing this thing here is the result of a translocation of a piece of chromosome 6 into chromosome 29. And we can demonstrate quite convincingly, I think, that the translocation occurs via a circular intermediate. But then when studying the same phenotype in other breeds in the world, Carol detected another mutation, which is shown here, and she could show that the second allele derives from the first one by the excision of a piece of this mute mutation, formation of a circle again, and then reintroduction of that circle accompanied by an, uh, an, an external piece of DNA back in the original location. But the, the reintegration by recombination perturbs the local gene and actually reproduces the same phenotype. Because I think what she did by studying cold color in cows is to actually put her finger on an exome shuffling mechanism. So in our genome, our genome has the ability to send out explorers in the forms of bubbles to go and fish exogenous pieces of DNA in other chromosomes and bring them back home. 
potentially to generate the formation of new, new uh, uh, exon combinations and therefore new genes. Okay, so, so we have this, this breed that is characterized by an amazing phenotype when it comes to muscular development that has been subject to such intensive selection that it's fragilized. So we, we have a relatively systematic approach towards these anomalies, which allow us to very quickly, in fact, identify as many as eight recessive defects, uh, plus a series of other things. So when we have that, we directly, in, in, con in consultation with them, we directly offer it to the breeders, who were very eager, in fact, to genotype their animals for this uh, mutation. So, in fact, our laboratory now has a relatively big diagnostic activity, so this shows you the evolution of the number of tests that we are doing per year for these mutations. They are all array-based mutations, so one experiment to have all the mutations, with a direct impact on lowering the frequency of the corresponding mutations. In fact, eradicating the defect. So you will say, well, it's not eradicated because that the frequency is not zero. In fact, the way the breeders have approached it is that the frequency is zero in the males, and in fact, they don't worry too much about the females, but, but because it's a recessive, and the animal needs to be homozygous to be affected, there are no more affected individuals. And if we look at the impact on perinatal mortality, it has approximately half, and it's now as good as that of other breeds, such as Holstein Friesian, that are considered to be very healthy uh, breeds. Okay. So that's kind of the first message. Impact of genomics on a breed like Belgian Blue. All these breeds deal more or less with genetic defects because inbreeding is always high. So just because of drift, some of these mutations can reach very high frequency really create uh, economic problems, and there are effective ways now to address that very fast. So we observed um, a, a phenomenon which seems to be quite uh, common, and which is clear. So we identify these mutations, they of course call the defect, but for at least two of them, we see that they do other things as well. And how did we, how, how did that that? So, there were two mutations that have a very high frequency in the population. So this one, a quarter of the animals were carried. I'll come back to that mutation later. And nevertheless, the, there were very few defective animals. So, given the frequency of the mutation and the size of the population, we should have seen hundreds, if not thousands, of these dwarfs. And we didn't see so where were they going? In fact, the, the PhD student did a prospective study, and he showed that if you take matings between heterozygous animals, at birth, you have the Mendelian proportions. So half of them are heterozygous. But if you follow these animals during their growth, a significant proportion of them is going to die, and it's going to die because they have a dysregulated inflammatory response. So when they are exposed to pathogens, they essentially overreact, their inflammation is excessive, and they die from the fact that they cannot downregulate their inflammatory response. So the impact of this mutation is not only via dwarfism, but because it affects a very complex trait, which is susceptibility to infectious diseases. So that increased the impact and the importance of having identified the mutation. So this is another example of pleotropy from another breed, but which was for us very interesting. So, so this is a called Hashispina, so it's a developmental defect due to a mutation in the Frankai gene. And so this mutation has, uh, the carriers represent 7.5% of Holstein Friesian, of which there are millions of animals, tens of millions of animals. To find these cases, we really had to find. It was difficult to find 10 cases like that in Europe, while, again, you would expect to have thousands of them. Where are they? But in this case, we could show that the vast majority of the homozygous animals die before birth. 
it's an embryonic leap. Only very few of them would, would reach the end of gestation, and you would see them. So, again, you have a pleiotropic effect here. This mutation, which was identified because it caused a genetic defect, a developmental defect, its main effect is fetal uh, death. And so you, you don't see that, except that your cow that was pregnant is not pregnant anymore, except that the fertility of your herd goes down. And so we said, God, you know, so if this, if this defect had not been seen in an exceptional small number of animals, we would never have known about this thing while it's affecting a very important trade in agriculture, which is fertility. And we said, well, doesn't that, how many embryonic lethals exist which we never see and which might in fact contribute to declines in fertility? So one of the observations in, in animal breeding is that while productivity is increasing, nearly always fertility is decreasing. And people are asking themselves the question, why is that? And the common answer is, it's, a, it's you know, because the animals spend so much of their energy on producing milk or meat, that it's, it's just a correlated effect, but it's a polygenic effect. And we said, well, maybe true, maybe not, but could it also be to the fact that there is an increase of the frequency of homozygosity for embryo? And so we said, okay, let's have a, uh, a look at that, and that's the, the second story. And because we postulated that we were looking at embryonic lethality, which is an undetectable phenotype, we could not use forward genetics, which starts from the phenotype and goes to the DNA, but we could try to use a reverse genetic approach going from the DNA uh, to the, the field. So there, there is a, before starting here, there is a fundamental population uh, uh, genetics question. Why are we diploid? Well, we are diploid, I think, because that's a very good way of expanding the size of our genome. So we don't have that many genes, 20,000. It's still too many genes to, to be able to sustain with only one copy of your genome. The child that you would have 20,000 intact copies from the parent that would give you the 20,000 genes is too low. So if you have two copies, well then the child that at least one copy of each gene is functional becomes much more important. So, so diploidy, I think, is a mechanism that has evolved and that either to allow or that has allowed expansion of the, the genome by uh, allowing at least one copy of each gene to be functional in the vast majority of the uh, of individuals. But that implies, if this is true, that many of us are going to carry some very deleterious mutations that would be, let's say, lethal or highly deleterious at a homozygous. And people have been trying to estimate how many such mutations we do carry on average, for instance, in the human population. And the way they have done that is by looking at the increase in perinatal lethality as a function of the increase in kin kinship coefficients between the parents or inbreeding coefficients of the, the fetus. So people go and look at families in, in populations that practice uh, inbreeding to see how it increases problems, perinatal problems. And the people that have done that, they typically estimate that on average, humans are carrying of the order of one lethal equivalent. So that's kind of what uh, uh, people have estimated. But that does not uh, address the problems of the number of embryonic lethals. It's a little bit like Rashispina. The only thing you see there are things that are causing problems which are visible around birth. But we, it's very difficult to know what proportion of miscarriages in women might actually be due to homozygosity for uh, embryonic peoples. And, you know, go a bit everywhere and ask the famous uh, human geneticist, how much do you think? And actually you have the odds. And so what we try to do is we try to address that by simulation. And so to do that, we 
took the all X, so, so he took the whole, let's say, uh, uh, set of genes, the whole exome, and we used mouse data, knockout data, to estimate what proportion of our genes are essential. And, you know, when you look at the knockout data, it's around 25% to 30% of our genes that are essential genes. So knockout for homozygosity for knockout alleles for approximately 70%, 70% of the genes is perfectly tolerable by your average one. But let's say 30% are when knockouts of the two alleles are causing uh, lethality. And, and so then we, we also estimated what fraction of the mutations in this exonic space would give you uh, uh, stop gains or frame shift mutations. And then we estimated in known diseases what the fraction of the lethal mutations are uh, due to stop gains and fringe. And so you, if you put this whole thing together and knowing the mutation rate, you can actually estimate that the number of embryonic mutations for new embryonic lethals should be around one in every hundred gametes or a little bit or a little bit more. And then what we did was we simulated the appearance of that kind of mutation at that rate in the in the genome and as a function of the effective population size we tried to estimate the number of such embryonic vehicles which were carried by an individual on average. So remember epidemiology using perinatal lethality says around one. So we are going to estimate that, but now try to also have numbers about undetectable embryonic fetals. We are going to look at the average frequency of this mutation and the percentage of the conceptuses that die from these mutations and what fraction of these deaths are due to common versus rare mutations. And so to make a long story short, so, in a population that has an effective population size of 100, the number of mutations like that carried per individual is, would be between one half and one. And so this is, would be typical for bovine populations. And in a population with an effective population size of 10,000, which is considered to be suitable for human, it would be between five and 10. So in fact, we think that all of us are carrying, on average, between 5 and 10 embryonic mutants. So just the fact that this number increases with effective population size was a bit of a surprise, even from Bonny Primors, who told me it should be constant. But nevertheless, so, so what is constant is the proportion of the offspring in the population that die from homozygosity. And that is something that is independent of the population size, and always around one and a half percent within these conditions. But what is interesting is that in a population size of 100, pretty much all the deaths are due to common detectable variants that have a frequency of 2% or more, so you could detect them. While in human populations, they are all due to exceedingly rare variants, so detecting them is going to be exceedingly difficult and there will be a lot. Here, very few mutations will account for all the problems of embryonic mortality in such a population, motivating us to try to detect uh, these things. And so we started to try to detect them using reverse genomes. So we have projects where, for plenty of reasons, we sequence lots of animals. And here we looked at the exos of around 600 cows. And so Carole and her team detected within the exos having sequenced these animals, 186,000 approximately polymorphisms, and in those there are 1,400 stop gains, 100 stop loss, 3,000 frame shifts, 1,300 splice sites, 85,000 missets, of which around 23,000 would be predicted by SIFT or polyphen or those to be damaged. Okay, so when, when we looked at uh, the corresponding data, there was something unexpected. So this is comparing the same kind of data, and it's done very carefully, 
in humans and in cats. So what you see here are Chinese from Beijing, Japanese from Tokyo, Finnish, Great Britain, Brexit, CEU, so, so these guys obviously now need to be studied separately, Europeans uh, uh, from Nigeria, and these are different uh, cattle breeds. So the great things are the number of synonymous mutations for which an individual is on average heterozygous, and the yellow ones are the, the, the non-synonymous ones. And the surprising thing for us was there is more genetic variation in domestic cattle than in humans, including Africans. So everybody always says, you guys have been selecting these potatoes so much, no more genetic variation, big risk, our pathogen will come and kill everybody because they are all genetically identical. Well, this threat seems to apply more to humans than it applies to cattle. It's still bizarre to think that the bottom bottleneck that is domestication seems to have been not so stringent or doesn't have such a severe effect on genetic variation than what we, our ancestors, come in Africa, have come through. This being said, if you now look at the ratio of synonymous over non-synonymous variants, well, you see that this ratio is higher in bovine than in you. And that is telling us something about uh, eff efficacy of purifying selection. So, although there is more variation, if you look at the ratio, there seems to be a bigger proportion of synonymous variants over non-synonymous ones in these cows than in the in human. And if you look at loss of function variants, so things that are predicted to be highly deleterious, well, there you you in fact have fewer. It's nearly the same, but significantly fewer in cattle than in you. So what we think is happening is that domestication of cows was actually not such a strange bottleneck, and there is still a lot of genetic variation in domestic cattle. But in the last, let's say, 100 years, people have started to select extremely, extremely heavily, this inducing a lot of inbreeding, and what inbreeding does, it exposes a lot of these mutations at the homozygous state that are very efficiently purified out of the, uh, the population. But that was unexpected. What I forgot to mention a bit earlier is that, so the expectation is, let's say that you have five humans would have, let's say, five to ten very severe mutations for which they would be heterozygous. Bovine, let's say, half to one, so ten times less. But if you look at these exomes and you look at what you think would be very severe mutations, stop genes, frame shifts, fly size, you have 120. So, so there are plenty of mutations that look extremely severe, but probably are not, given this big discrepancy between what population genetics tell you and what sequence analysis tell you. But that also told us if we found, if we want, for instance, in Europe, to find the 5 to 10 embryonic lethals within the 120 loss of function variants, how are we going to do to differentiate uh, these two? Okay. And so our aim was to now see which ones of all these mutations that we detected would be embryonic lethals. And we could take advantage of the fact that our populations of animals are being genotype very large scale for genomic selection, so I'll come back to that later. And so what we did was, out of the 94,000, we took the most interesting ones, the most severe ones, mainly, so these guys, here, these guys, we put them on cheap arrays, which we are using for uh, genomic selection, and we genotyped in Belgium 10,000 animals, and uh, a company that we work for in New Zealand on our breed genotyped 35,000 uh, individuals. So lots of genotyping, but which we could do because it's part of breeding programs. And then we looked for depletion in homozygosity. So we said, well, look at these animals that are, uh, the animals that are genotyped are a priori healthy individuals. For every variant, given its frequency, how many homozygous did you expect, and how many did you observe? 
if you have less than what you expected, you want to have a low p value. You want to have a significant depletion in homozygosity. And so these are, are the results. So every dot here, if it's a gray dot, is a control uh, value. It's something that was present on the array for genomic selection. It's a random sequence. And so what you see is the statistic that I described as a function of the viral yield frequency. The ones that are colored here are the ones that Carol is interested in. So forget about the black ones. This is part of the first part of the top. It's the eight diseases. They define a line, which means that you've never found a homozygous individual. Obviously, you have been very sick or dead. The ones that we are looking at now are red ones, loss of function iron, so defined as stop gain, splice size, or uh, frame shift. And the yellow ones are missense variants that were considered predicted to be highly deleted. So this is a zoom in this thing. And so what, what you see is that you have some of these variants that for which you have never found a homozygous, despite the fact that the frequency is relatively high, up to 6%, and that gives you a very high p-value. Generally speaking, we can look at the distribution of the red the, and the yellow dots and compare them with the controls. And so the controls are the, the gray ones, and the better controls, I won't tell you too much, but are the blue ones. And by looking in the right way, I think, at how these things are distributed in the graph, we could estimate that for the red ones, amongst the ones we have tested, 15% are loss of function variants, and amongst the, the yellow ones, 6% are loss of function variants. Actually, not bad if you think about the, the human things, I don't know if that apply to here, but remember, we did that 120 loss of function variants if you sequence the, the genome. If you do the kind of simulations we did, you estimate that around 10%, that is one order of magnitude less, are truly embryonic lethal, and this figure is certainly uh, in the same ballpark. Okay, so that's good. We know that amongst the hundreds or thousands of red mutations tested, 15% are, are the ones we look for, embryonic lethals. Amongst the yellow ones, 6%. Now, which ones are the embryonic lethals, and how can we prove that? So what we did was we took the most interesting ones. So the ones that were at the top here, we start at the top and we go down the line here, and we do a prospective analysis. So what we do is we search in the population for matings between carrier bulls and carrier uh, cows, and then we wait for the cows to come, and our prediction is, if it's an embryonic lethal, we should never see a homozygous mutant. And so Carol has tested that now for, I forgot how many, here is the list. So one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine. And all of them are embryonic lethals. So using a reverse genetic approach, she identified a series of embryonic lethal. The characteristic of this thing is that they are all, except one I think, involved in basic cellular functions. So. So remember, 30% of the genes are essential, 70% are not. Well, so here we identify essential genes. If you look at their function, they are all part of molecular biology 101, DNA replication, transcription. So they play roles in basic cellular uh, uh, mechanisms. So these animals, uh, all these mutations together, um, account for approximately 6% of the mating, of the babies. So our prediction is that if we genotype the population for these mutations, we can improve, I would say, the, the fertility by 6%. So altogether, they account for a non-negligible, economically important fraction of the reduction in fertility. So the only problem now is that we don't know how to use it in the field. So if we give it to the breeders, they will want the breeding companies who are selling semen from wolves to sell semen from animals that have none of the genetic defects we identified and none of these embryonic defects. The problem is that 
there are virtually no animals like that left. So, so what would happen is that you would have to select so severely that in fact you would create a problem because you would create a very, very strong bottom. And so what we are thinking about now with the breeders is how can you use that information in an effective way but without actually creating more problems that solve the problem. And we can come back to that later. So at the present time, this information is not yet used, although it's having a relatively important impact on uh, fertility. Okay, I don't know whether I still have time. What, what time is it? Well, no time. But tell me there's a study. Okay. So the, 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 the last part is, so defects, so far, we look at monogenic genetic things in a way. But as I told you in the beginning, the, the, the phenotypes that breeders are interested in, agri agriculturally important phenotypes, are virtually always uh, quantitative polygenic traits. And so, muscular development is certainly one of these. So, the question is um, uh, you know, what is the molecular basis? of muscular hypertrophy, and especially the increase in muscular hypertrophy that we have seen uh, developing between 1980 and now, and for which there is still a lot of variation. Heritability is still around 20%. Note that if you talk to a human geneticist, he will tell you this has, this is extremely polygenic. There must be like height in humans, hundreds and hundreds of genes, each, if not thousands, each with a very small effect. And so we said, well, let's have a look at that. Let's see what the architecture is of the, the genetic variation for muscle mass as it still exists or that was exploited uh, since uh, 1980s. So the first thing we said is, could it be that there is a second storyline by us where one allele that has a big effect on muscle mass very quickly move through the population. And so to try to find that, we look for signatures of selection. So if that were the case, you would find in the new Belgian blue animals a region which is completely homozygous and very different, very differentiated from what existed before. In fact, when we do this test in the genome, we detect signatures of selection that are, are positive controls, like myostatin, we find. But there is nothing new. So a priori, there is no equivalent story between 85 and 2015 as what we observe between 60 and 85, where one mutation went very, very high. So nothing equivalent. So you, you could imagine that you still have big effects, but they are not fixed. Maybe they are too, going towards fixation, but because their effect is not so big, they are still walking through the population. How can you detect that? You can do genome-wide association studies. Whether there should be genetic variation uh, uh, and should be associated with genetic variation. So that's when we and so that's where humans would say you're not going to find anything unless you study ten or hundred thousand people. So this experiment is done, let's say, with five hundred to six hundred individuals. In fact, when we do that, and we do it in two steps, we find one, two, three, four uh, peaks that have big effects. And the characteristic of all these effects is that the mutation that is increasing muscle mass is sitting on one specific haplotype. So if you look at the corresponding region, obviously you have multiple haplotypes in the population. All of them behave in the same way, except one is a big haplotype has a big effect. For us, that means relatively recent mutation. Up here, and heat, it's going up in the population, and we tested that, and you can actually see the increase in frequency of these haplotypes from 1970 to approximately uh, now. So these are the corresponding effects. The striking feature is that they explain, let's say, between 5 and 8% of genetic variants, unheard of in human genetics. So there's something fundamentally different between the architecture of these polygenic traits in human and 
in domestic animals. So what we think is this is that there is extremely strong directional selection for these traits, so that any mutation that appears in the population that affects that trait is directly captured by selection and moves through the, the, the population. So, difference between human and, uh, and domestic animals is that although these are typical quantitative traits, a part of the genetic variant, which is around, let's say, 10% in this case, is due to what we to call major uh, efforts. So, uh, the funny thing was that when Caron now looked at uh, the associations using not the control SNPs, the gray ones, but looking at the functional SNPs, which have put on the array, so, so sorry, I, I realized I missed labels, but so uh, Carol and Tom redid an analysis, and you see these peaks here, this is the entire genome, I think, and you see a series of peaks. So three of these peaks are, we now know, genetic defects, which we have studied before. So the strange thing is that if you take the alleles that are causing genetic defects, you, of course, detect them at the homozygous state in affected individuals, but this study is based on 500 healthy individuals, of which some carry the allele, but are not affected by the allele in the sense that they are very, very sick, but you see an effect on their, in this case, muscle bones. So, what we find is evidence for balancing selection. So, in fact, these breeders have been selecting like crazy guys for muscle mass, and now what they are playing with are alleles that increase muscle mass. If you have one dose, if you have two doses, the other one falls apart because it has a disease. So they are really at the limit of uh, physiology. And so, so these are the examples it's of the uh, three things where genetic defects have been selected in this population because they have the pleiotropic effect, which is selected for. There is balancing uh, selection. And we've seen that in other breeds as well. So we've seen an embryonic lethal in, in Scandinavian breeds, so it's a deletion. It's causing embryonic lethality, but one copy of the deletion increases milk production very strongly. So the breeders select for milk production, and by doing that, they increase the frequency of a genetic defect that is causing embryonic lethality. Okay, here we finished. So we go to more general things. So farmers are happy that we have health and genetic defects. I hope we'll be able to help them for fertility through the embryonic lethals. Now they are more interested in what they call positive traits. They say we always go for defects and also work on positive traits. So then it Muscle mass, it's only an example of one trait, is such a positive trait. So the first thing we detect is there are some major gene effects, but be very careful because some of these guys are causing problems at the homozygous state. But it only explains that say, between 10 and 15 percent of the genetic variants, what is the nature of the rest. So to try to address that, we use the methods of genomic selection. I don't know whether you're familiar with that, but this is a cartoon that is trying to tell you how people select their own dairy cattle. So they have a reference population of tens of thousands, now hundreds of thousands of animals, for which you have phenotypes on milk production basis. And they have also genotyped these animals for, let's say, 50,000 SNPs scattered throughout the gene. And then they develop, they develop mathematical models that are trying to allow you to predict the phenotype of an individual based on its genotype. But when I say genotype, it's not one SNP. It's the genotype of all the SNPs combined. So they try to develop the best possible models. And what they want is to be able to go into the general population, including for a very small cow or even an embryo, take the DNA, genotype the DNA, and apply the prediction equations to predict the phenotype that this animal will have in the future. And that's how selection is done now 
have an extremely large scale. And so you end up with animals that have been selected based on reading their DNA. So the, the, the models that are being used here are of different kinds, and there are hundreds of possible uh, ways of approaching that, and engineers are very interested. They call it machine learning, and it turns out that animal breeders stick to what they are used to uh, use and have been used traditionally, which is called blood. So these are called mixed models. So these mixed model equations, which are very efficient uh, uh, systems, and also Bayesian approach to which there is a whole alphabet of different methods. The, dif the difference between these two, so this should be Bayes, not pairs. So the difference between these two methods in terms of hypothesis is that this one makes the, to make a, a long story short, makes the assumption that humans, human genetics is free. That is very highly polygenic, lots of genes, always very, very small effects. That is the hypothesis underlying cheap. The hypothesis underlying Bayesian methods is to allow for a distribution of effects where some would have large effects, some would have medium effects, and some would have small effects. And you can test what model your data favors by looking at the accuracy of prediction of the different models. If the biology is of the human kind, G blood will perform as well as the other ones. If the biology is for an exponential distribution of gene effects, then these models are going to perform better. And in fact, when Tom does that, and it's a bit preliminary, G blood is doing as well as any other uh, of the models. So what this suggests is that a trait like Russell Mars in this population has an architecture which is for a part the same as what you find in humans, extremely polygenic, but probably because of directional selection, the regular sweeping through the population of big effects. So a fraction is due to big effects that rapidly sweep through the population unless they are spread there by balancing selection because of the homozygous state, they cause a problem, while the rest is uh, polygenic. Okay, so, so what is happening in Belgian blue is trying to catch up, in fact, with what is happening in dairy cattle and being able for the positive traits to apply genomic selection systematically. So what I, I said in the beginning is that we would try to make a link with human uh, genetics. So what you have to know is for the last 10 years, cows, at least in part of the world, are entirely and only selected based on the reading of their DNA. So there are millions of cows for which DNA is sampled at birth or even before birth, and for which the DNA is read on cigarettes. And using the scheme that I should show you of genomic selection, the top animals, the, the animals that will be the parents of the future generation, are selected. And the expectation is that this will more than double the genetic response for the selected trait. Obviously, it varies depending on the trait, but especially for very complex traits, which have a low heritability, the gains are considered to be enormous. So, this is a method that you cannot not use in animal breeding anymore, just because you are not competitive anymore. So, the people that use it are just going much faster than what you. So, it has become a, a generalized method. And and so what I think may happen is that similar uh, mathematical approaches are going to be used to transform genomic information in uh, uh, information that will assist the clinician in a number of circumstances in terms of choice of treatment, prediction of evolution of the disease. So one can a priori postulate that medically important traits have an architecture that is complex and which is in part uh, inherited. And so it's, I think it's possible that by applying the same kind of approaches, which require huge and well-constructed reference population, you may actually see the same information tricking in the, in the clinic. And this is certainly 
uh, very attentive and trying to uh, potentially contribute to these kinds of uh, uh, evolution. So this is what I wanted to tell you. Before stopping, just a, a series of acknowledgements. So this is really very much the work of Carole Charlier, Tom Druet, and Wout of Copitus, which are the senior people in the lab. So we have a number of PhD students that have participated, Ardo, Wambo, and Chad. Hope I'm not forgetting anyone. We have a fantastic crew of technicians, and I, I don't even have all of them here, but certainly the oldest ones. This is work that is typically done in close co collaboration with uh, breeding companies, and we have funding from a number of sources, which some are mentioned there. And sorry for having taken so much of your time. Just the, the movement of the herds in the beginning. 
Yeah. That was the mistake. Yeah. And they made a lot of opportunity for yeah. Britain with the yeah. wild speech. Well, they were wild, they were just controlled yeah. the, the territory. But, yeah, I think if you see some parts of the world now, for instance, the interaction between wild boar and some villages, you have, you have, uh, you have uh, wild animals actually that, that's come very, very close to you So you've had interactions between them. Just look at our foxes in the middle of the cities. Now. So I, I, I think that there, it's wrong to look at domestication as being a thing that is very exceptional. Yeah, but once and then. Ah, that's another story. That's about uh, the recently new mutation with the pig and pig. Can it be like this? You know, when you start a strong selection, uh, the sort of select mutators. Okay, and then, well, sort of, uh, you induce, well, it's well known stories that when you start a strong selection, you induce the yeah. Because to, to overcome the yes. yes. interaction yes. 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 can it be the same story with these mutations? Okay, so they are. So, so I, I'll say, uh, kind of translate what you are saying the way I think about it is that, in fact, every time you select for a trait, you select for the trait and the ability to respond to right. selection. Yes, right? yes. So you yes. accept yes. it. Yes. And, and, uh, and, uh, uh, so, uh, I think here you, uh, and, and so that, that's, that is, I think, especially effective when the selection is changed a lot. So that is, so in, in terms of natural population, you say that the environment is changed. So actually the target is moving all the time. So, so then, in fact, I think you can, you can see that you have a secondary effect on mutators. And I think the difficulty and I, I haven't played enough yet with these things, is the linkage between the mutator and the target gene. Uh, so, so I think if your mutators are on the same chromosome as the gene which is affecting the phenotype, yeah. then this whole thing's, thing works very well. But if the mutator and the target gene are on different chromosomes, then the efficiency is not. So then it's bizarre to see that uh, well, if you combine it with a strong selection, I mean, you, uh, you, 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 can, you, you, you sweep out all the well, negative mutations, yeah. but you always have a good mutation, yeah. what you need. But you can yes. generate the opinion yeah. separate. Yeah. 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 So let's, let's, uh, let's, 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 let's see it together. Let's have to play, because the whole thing is, what is the optical mutation rate? Right? Is it a trait that is understood? Yeah, yeah. So you have this whole yeah. field yeah. That's, that's very easy on the other. You can get a bit difficult when yeah. you do the model. Yeah. Well, that's a story. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, did I interrupt you? Oh, anyway. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know. It's a little bit. It's a story about um, the truth. You know, yeah. 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 Uh, why it goes so fast and all that? Uh, and why it's so different from human? Big men, big humans. Right. Yeah. Uh, can we. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, but what I'm saying is when you. It's how to say. It's a reaction on the provocative background. So that one already destabilized uh, genotype factor. So when you introduce this. Uh, what's this? Stos, stos, stos. Mastitin gene. So you just. Break all the system. And the, the mutations which would not affect normal. Quickly generated variation. Yes, but, but uh, they would not produce any effect or very small effect yeah. on normal cattle. Yeah. But they produce a very. Did you, can you try to check it? Well, so what we know is in crossbreeding. Yeah, that's crossbreeding. We can respond to the system.
talk about the education of common education. As I understand, about 30% of animals uh, are areas of common education. So, what about ingredients? If we uh, uh, remove these animals, uh, we will have a great ingredient population. Yes, yeah. yeah, so that's, that's really the problem that we, we are facing now. So what, what is the most efficient and economical way of using the information? The funny thing is that we can see them class. They said, give us the test. And very quickly, what we saw was breed. So we have several breeding companies in the country. And one breeding company started to only sell semen from bulls that had no mutation. And the other ones had to do the same. So otherwise, they wouldn't sell one thing. So, so there was just a natural way of using information. So farmers didn't use information, but then they didn't have to do any expenses, and they pushed the pressure on the breeding companies, and they did it because they were in competition. But the problem, which we told them, is exactly what you say, that is, everybody carries limitations. So, now we know this one, but if you only use these few goods, you will have work, no problem for us, but tomorrow it's another one. And so, the question is, what is the most rational way to do that? As I said, now with the embryonic heaters, it's not 30 percent, it's 100 percent of the bulls carry at least one. And so, so now we don't give the information, but we want to try to uh, together define the best strategy, which is probably assortative mating, or not assortative, but it's probably intelligent mating. But that means that they will have to genotype for animals, there is a cost, and so it becomes a lot. So, so what you what you see in, in the so what you see in the world of having to do is that all these all these uh, it depends on the situation. Okay, so if I look at cows, breeding was done by organizations which are called co cooperatives. So farmers come together and they collaborate. And they have decided to all together measure a certain number of traits. And it's very much the same all over the world. There is an organization of co-ops that de de uh, defines which traits are going to be measured, also that you can compare it to the And I think today they measure maybe 50 traits. And these 50 traits are, are let's see, the scale production, it's of course the amount of milk, it's also the composition of the milk, and it's of course the use of traits that are related to health, to fertility. So there are lots of different uh, traits. So if you go to, to and, and the thing is that the way selection was done in the past, you have to have measured on a very, very large population to be effective. So people collaborate. If you go to pigs or, or birds, it's all part of very, very few companies. And the companies don't even tell you what, what uh, phenotypes they, they measure. They do it relatively secret. And that's what I think will happen in one line is that it will go to that direction. So companies will test a herd of 10,000 animals, and they will measure 200 different traits, very, very accurate. And we can go to New Zealand, and I've seen incredible things. So, for instance, in the middle. So, New Zealand is a country that is very advanced for milk production, but it's their biggest problem. They sell milk to Japan. Japanese people can taste the substance in the milk, which for them is bitter. And we cannot taste New Zealanders are selected for cows that do not produce that substance. So New Zealanders have, have uh, so they produce uh, dried so, uh, milk powder. So they, they have big factories where milk treatments on metal plates and are hot. Some milk make the plates dirty very quickly. 
other approach doesn't mean the K very dirt, it directly select them. You want to select for K, that doesn't mean they are factories dirty because they have to clean every week instead of every month for the customer. So the number of trades that they are selected. selection combined with these methods has identified a series of causal conditions which are which are failing. So when you pick animals that are naturally born, very few of them have the perfect combination of quality and disease. But what they do is they will take the best ones and then they will just do CRISPR Cas9 on 50 lines at the same time or 100. They don't need 100% efficiency, but they try to just add these naturally existing variants artificially to the animals. And it's starting that. So I think it's a good time to think again about the transgenic environment. Because anything doesn't necessarily leave, no, nothing left, you know, no neomycin resistant gene, no. In fact, you, you copy natural variants. So you cannot even say, if you see the other one, there is no way to distinguish the transient animal from the natural one. That's fine, you know, there's schools, they always demonstrate that that is the result of transgenics. Yeah. But they have nothing to do with yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, this, okay, like, like they show this bull with two heads as an example of mutation, of Chernobyl. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so any other question? 